next week on Visualize, we're back in the studio for the first of the seven programmes there. So tonight, that means we have the last of the three specials. And for this special, we're in London. The reason we're in London is to see David Bowie. Now, David Bowie was the most exciting, provocative and innovative rock star of the 70s. And uh, in 1983, he had his biggest success with the Serious Moonlight Tour, the Let's Dance tracks. And uh, this time around, he's on the Glass Spider Tour. Now, the Glass Spider Tour reaches Slane tomorrow. It's the first time he's ever played a concert in Ireland. And we came to London to talk to him here at the Hilton Hotel, up on the 25th floor. So while I go up and check him out and see if he's there, you take a look at this. The last time that I did a show was 1983, and it was virtually um, a showcase for the songs that I've written over the last 18, 20 years. The show that I'm doing this year will be very, very theatrical compared to that last show, much more like the shows that I used to do in the early 70s. I've been working on the ideas for it for the last six months. It's more like uh, if you can get anywhere near a rock and roll review, it's, uh, it's some, somewhere in there. It's, it's going to be rock theatre. It'll be a lot of fun. I can't tell you any more at the moment. Oh, it won't be a surprise, man. But it's a mighty big show. When the wind blew through this construction, it made sounds of wailing, crying, tiny wails, tiny cries. Spiders would search frantically for their mother, but the glass spider had long gone, having known that they would survive somehow on their own. Oh, she had blue eyes, almost like a human's. They shed tears at the winter turn of the centuries. David, uh, the glass spider tour of 1987, how's it gone so far? Oh, is it going so far? I suppose I'm quite pleased with it. Uh, it's, it's, it's really difficult because I've, I, this is it's as new to me as it is to everybody else. I mean, the complexity of the thing is uh, really quite a, a extraordinary, just getting the thing from one place to another yeah. and then getting everything set up in time. Um, and as far as being on stage, it's the most peculiar feeling to be doing something quite so theatrical in front of such large audiences. But over the last week or so, it's been quite fantastic. Well, when you say quite so theatrical, are you talking yeah. about like just the actual sort of setup of the whole thing in terms of what it incorporates and what does it incorporate? Not, like, yeah, not, not only that, music? not in terms of just special effects or something, you know, because it doesn't actually revolve around special effects. The physicality of what happens on stage has become the focus point for me, the complexity of that physicality. There's an awful lot of modern dance involved in it. Um, so the concentration is within ourselves on stage, whereas on a stadium thing, you usually exert a lot of energy outwards to the audience itself. But when a lot of the energy is reverting backwards and forwards between mm -hmm. the, answer, uh, the uh, uh, actors and the, and the dancers, in that way, it becomes a completely different kind of feeling. And one feels that a lot of that is broadcast out on the screens that we use. <laughs> It's a novel situation. <laughs> well, when you say modern dance music, I mean, yeah. are you talking about sort of like American street dance, hip hop type stuff almost? Um, th the two areas I wanted to explore were that, that, that very aspect and also uh, uh, modern European dance. And there's a, I guess, the kinds of dancing that we're using are not explored at all on things like uh, videos or MTV. Those kinds of dance haven't really been uh, seen in, in, in the rock and roll context which I think makes it kind of unique. Oh, well, I get the impression of what you just said, then, that you have kept up your interest in dance in terms of the old days of the Beckenham Arts Lab. Oh, I love it, yeah. I think it's great. I love exciting new kind. And the new wave of dancing at the moment is very savage, and it does owe a lot to street dance. That's why the people that I auditioned for the little troupe that I put together, I didn't want trained dancers or kind of, mm. you know, those faggy kind of guys you get on Hollywood or something. So, like, one of our guys is next gang leader, uh, another yeah. one was very strangely as a savage punk who used to be a boy in a bubble. It's the most peculiar thing. Lived for the first six years of his life in that situation has developed this strange flipping thing from watching television when he was a kid and having to reply to the television by learning to flip. We worked with several people in areas of modern dance that you may well have had over here. I don't know if you ever had Momix. 
No. Uh, dance company, an uh, experimental dance company from California. Well, they worked with us on uh, a lot of the situations. From then, we took the idea of using skis and uh, having dance things performed on skis, which are quite peculiar. <laughs> Well, how nice of you to turn up. I'd like to introduce my band. On bass, Carmine Rojas. <laughs> On guitar, as always, Carlos Alamar. <laughs> On drums, Alan Childs. <laughs> On keyboards, Dickie Cottle. <laughs> I'm very honored to have Peter Frampton on lead guitar. <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, your help, and here's a disappearing trick. Ah. Well, when you always decide to go out on tour, you have to come up with something very different. So this time around, how, how involved? Well, I don't have to. Well, I mean, you, 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 you always uh, want to. I push it. myself into yeah. it, it could, because I really, I mean, it's. Um, I've always had this problem, is that I was never happy as just a, um, a singer, you know, because yeah. I, never, I never really was that confident in my own um, abilities as just a singer, that it would be at all interesting to anybody at all. Um, so I thought that I wanted to establish myself as a theatrical entity, as I, I derived so much satisfaction from going to the theatre or to yeah. go and watch dance. And that it would be great to be able to combine that feeling with the rock music that, I, that I'd lived with and, and really wanted to play and write. The late 60s were, were great in, uh, for people like me because it was the era of, of multimedia shows and great music going on. And, and London was full of meme companies, mime companies, the best of which was a, a group of uh, uh, mimes called the Lindsay Camp Company who were very fundamental in teaching me quite a bit about stage work, stage craft, how lighting worked, how you could use your body on stage and make a dramatic statement. One always sort of thought that theatre was about props and things, but it's not at all. I mean, I hopefully could do any of the shows that I have done without any of the scenery or props that I've used, because a lot of it was body work, how, the body language, how the body moves, and, and, and what statements it can make on stage. And I kind of got all that from the Lindsay Kemp Company. I don't know why I look like this, Mrs. Kendall. My mother was so beautiful. She was knocked down by an elephant in the circus while she was pregnant. Something must have happened, don't you think? A favourite role is a little tiny thing, cameo role that I did for John Landis in a movie called oh, Into the Night, man. where John gave me complete freedom to sort of play it out. <laughs> uh, what are you talking about? OK. I represent <laughs> Monsieur Mavi. And uh, I can assure you that he can be far more reasonable than the Savard. The Savard? The Shah Secret, please. Death Squad. Iranian Gestapo. Shaheen's boys. Shaheen's boys. <laughs> I thank you, Ed. I do like you. You're very good. The stones. What? Where are the stones? I can't help you. We do understand each other, don't we? Least likely, I guess, Seems I hope anyway, is the hunger. I felt very uncomfortable with that role, although I loved being involved in a Tony Scott movie. You know, John speaks before he thinks. Is that what he does? I can't figure him out. Please, play the Lola for me, even if it is a little saccharine. Are you sure you're not John's father? Quite sure. If you go back to the early images of all the fun, say, oh, Aladdin Sane and Ziggy Stardust and yeah. the whole lot, I mean, was that sort of trying to exercise some ghosts within you in some ways? Uh, yeah, like I Being think afraid to be David Bowie. A lot of those times, I, I guess, was um, a way of, uh, uh, of making up a pastiche of myself. Maybe a lot of it was just sort of um, exaggerations of, of some finer points of how I thought, or not quite so fine ways of the way I thought. 
Uh, I think I blew those out of um, uh, context and ma made them sort of cartoon figures of how I was thinking at the time. Do you remember Rick Well, you found new ways to be enigmatic by the late 70s in terms of, say, the Ashes to Ashes video, which brought video right into the 80s. Yeah. So how do you see yourself going, say, in the next few years? <laughs> by that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, gee, I don't know. I really can only work from day to day. It really is hard for me to have any conf concept of what I'd be doing in even six months from now. Yeah. Well, six months from now, I'll be finishing this tour. That's the only thing I know. Well, also, you're going to be involved with Mick Jagger in a movie. What's yeah. that about? Can't tell you a thing about that. There's too many other people out there who want to do a movie like this. <laughs> but what we did do, we explored an, uh, our idea about a year ago, and we, we spent quite a bit of time sending paper backwards and forwards to wherever we were. And we got down a, a good basic storyline that we felt was um, really credible and something which was slightly humorous and interesting but had a darker side to it. And then we found a screenwriter that we both liked very much and we got him employed in, in, in writing it up for us. And I think it's about finished now, so I can't yeah. wait to read it. Do you see much in today's modern music that's still David Bowie? I mean, obviously it was there in the late 70s, obviously there was the early 80s, but what about now? Oh, in what do you mean? The, the actuality yeah, that there's... Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I do. I, I, I find it uh, sometimes very flattering and sometimes a bit disheartening. Depends which band it is. But um, uh, a lot of bands that uh, took influence... But I would never... I think it's all hybrids and amalgamations of bands, you know. I don't think that any of us were ever one single influence. There was myself, Iggy, Roxy Music, T-Rex. I mean, we all put in our, our two cents and uh, produced all this kind of stuff, this porridge of sound and, and, and look. Where does the inspiration come from these days? I mean, 1987. I think I turned inwards a lot more than I thought I would try and be... Uh, once upon a time, I'd try and be a lot more objective and almost cold in my um, sense, sensitivities or sensibilities as to what was happening outside of me. Um, and I would establish some kind of impressionistic point of view of what was happening, almost from a detached kind of level. I was very seriously affected by my dreams. The dream state seemed to be so potently full of images and, and uh, weaknesses and strengths that I felt were contained within myself. It came through art as well. When I started seeing things like movies by Salvador Dali and Bunuel, and work by De Chirico. It felt, it, it said, yes, that's exactly how my dreams felt. And that's how I want to write, or how, how do you work like that? And then I started reading people like uh, William Burroughs. I started learning about the cut-up techniques that they employed to, to create new ways of thinking. And I thought I'd try and apply that to writing. So that's kind of how it evolved. What's the name? What's the name? What's the name? It was a question of creating characters up until about 1976. And at that point, when I started working with Brian Eno, my emphasis changed from creating characters for stage, but actually really getting involved in, in finding out more about music. These days, I, sit, I, I tend to write from what's happening within myself. So it's a lot more subjective, I think, than it used to be. So is it a lot more personal then as well? Yes, it is, actually, yeah. feeling a tour coming on over the last three years. I build slowly over a long time and ideas gradually creep in and after three or four years I realize I've written a tour and I then have the excitement to want to go out and do it. Tour that we'll see it slain over the weekend. Is this the one that 
that is entirely David Bowie. I mean, like, did you sit down with people about a year ago and say, we'll work this one out, or is it you all the way? Um, it's me all the way. Um, the deciding what was going to be done, how I, it was real, but uh, I guess it was a question of converting a lot of dream ideas that I'd had, because I, I like Eno, I've got I, Eno's habit of writing dreams down, which he applies to his music then. Well, I started applying that to my vision of what I wanted to do on stage. <laughs> For the sake of the show, uh, I built the set in such a way that it has a spider top, which for me is like a womb-like thing, and comes down into ship's rigging, which for me is like a sea voyage, and then life itself is played out on the bottom circus ring type thing. So. Sarah! Make it in a cluster. It's contagious. Four times Those things permeate from that kind of uh, beginnings and then they would be translated through my co-choreographer Tony Basil who in fact did the Diamond Dog show with me in 1974 yeah, and through the uh, dancers themselves they would uh, then pick up on what I was saying and then th throw their influences out of what happened to them on the streets or whatever and we start amalgamating all those ideas with an improvisational kind of workshop situation that went on whilst we were doing the, uh, the tour mm. uh, rehearsals. Well, you mentioned uh, Brian Eno there. Now, that was 10 years ago you worked with him on Low and Heroes. Have you any plans to work with him again? And Lodger. And Lodger, yeah. Yeah, the one that always gets forgotten. <laughs> um, I'd like, I got, a couple of years ago, I got a letter from him. <laughs> I'll probably reply in a couple of years, but uh, it's, we, our paths don't often cross, but uh, I would like very much one day to work with him again. Yeah. Indeed, as with uh, Robert Fripp. Yeah. It was somebody else I enjoyed working with tremendously. Well, the weather hasn't been that great on some of your gigs, oh, so does that make it even more physically demanding? It really is. It's very hard for the moving thing because uh, often we'll have... Our floor tends to be a mirror-like surface and I see dancers go sliding past me and say, I can't stop! And they just disappear off into the wings. I mean, it's like glass up there, literally. <laughs> the weekend you'll be playing this gig at Slane in the open air and in the daylight now will that take away in any way from the dramatic effect it might have had at night in the dark in with, with lights? obviously the lighting is pretty spectacular but fortunately I believe it's such a physical show that a lot of the uh, emphasis comes from the pure physicality of it it's relentless it's a very fast event horizon some three things are often happening at the same time on stage it's incredibly complex and quite hard to follow and I've found that the audience have to work as hard as we do on stage yeah. to keep the thing going. But so far, touch wood, <laughs> um, they, they, they really have given as much as, as I hope that we have. And yeah. it's, been, it's been extraordinary. Well, the tour ends in Japan in December, so yeah. you've been to most of the places that you're playing on this tour. So how do you feel about your first time in Ireland? I'm terribly excited about it, and I'm really happy that we've got here at last. OK, thanks very much, Dave. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tell you what, let's go from... Uh...